Okay, I, uh, I'm going to get started now. Um, first of all, uh, we have, I guess, homework three. Is, this is the last class I'm going to talk about uh, graph algorithms, um, at least explicitly. I, wanna, I guess this will finish the unit on graph algorithms, although we will uh, trickle, the, you, you will see them come and go uh, in other stuff we do this semester. Um, first of all, any questions about the homework? They've been some good questions about the homework on the Piazza and uh, stuff like that. The graph algorithms homework is due to, uh, Thursday, if I remember correct, right? Okay, so um, any questions about the homework? Any questions? Yes. Okay, so the question is um, about the coding examples. Do you get an input or output example? Um, well, you get an input file, okay? So you know, so the answer is the input is, is uh, specified, um, and that should be clear to understand. Um, as far as the output goes, you, there's two ways. You, what you really want with connected components is you want every vertex needs to know what component it's in. That's kind of really what ultimately you want, okay? Either you have for every component what vertices are in it, or for every vertex what components are, you know, which component is it in. Those are two equivalent ways of doing the information. So I don't really care which way, how you represent it, okay? But I want you to try to find these pieces. It's good practice just to make sure you really know what uh, depth first search is doing here. Okay. Any questions? Yes. It, it says in the, in the in that question, you want to should you submit the code? Print out the code and turn it in. Submit a printout of the code. Include a picture enough of it so that we see that your output was produced by a program. That is all. We're not going to run your program. We're not going to do anything like that. But it's, uh, you know, it's probably good to see that it came from a program. Okay? Any questions? Yes? Am I using the exact same test files as on the web page? We are not going to, I'm going to break it to you. We're not going to run your connected components algorithm. You run your connected components algorithm. It's so that you're actually, you want to, uh, I, th I think it's important that you guys understand depth first search is not just this wavy thing that, uh, oh, you walk over the graph. Okay, it's important to have uh, a concrete, you know, sense of what's going on. It's not magic. And so the simplest you know, real application of depth first search or breadth first search is, uh, you know, connected components. And I think it's good karma for you to write something that, uh, that, that, that builds them. And that's what the homework is getting you to. Okay? Any questions? Okay. Actually, on the subject of programming, the next assignment is the programming class, is a, is a, is a programming assignment. So we will talk about that next class, but, uh, but uh, uh, for m most of the homework here is uh, the theoretical stuff. Okay, um, today's daily problem, I believe, is the one that is on the screen now. Correct me if I'm wrong. Okay, uh, it's asking us if we want it, says if we're given a uh, directed uh, graph, we're given a, a, an undirected but weighted graph, and we let T be a shortest path spanning tray. I guess there should be a break there. Rooted at vertex V. What does that mean, first of all? We started talking a little bit about shortest path last class. We'll talk about for sure how do we find it. But what is a shortest path spanning tray? It is going to be we're going to start at some vertex V. And we're going to want to find this tree is going to tell us the way to find the shortest path to every other vertex in the graph. Okay? 
So you could imagine maybe this edge is 1, this edge is 10, this edge is 3, so, so, you know, 2, 1. Okay, let's say 4, 2, 3. In a shortest path spanning tree, we have a start, and we find the shortest path to every vertex. This vertex T, what's the length of its shortest path? It's going to be 1 plus 4. 3, that's 4, plus 2 is 6, plus 1 is 7. Okay, the length of a path is the sum of the edge weights on the path. Okay. If we're going to have the shortest path to every node, okay, there is a way of representing the shortest path of every node from V by a tree, okay, and uh, that is the shortest path spanning tree. Okay, any questions about that? The question here says, now suppose the edge weights in the graph are increased by each edge weight is increased by a constant k. Is this tree still going to be the shortest path spanning tree uh, of V? Okay, you either need to give me a proof or you need to give me a counterexample. Which is it? Yes. Uh, I think it's uh, no. And my counterexample is like the triangle with um, edge one, one, three, and then increase by two. Okay, so let's look at your thing here. You were saying one, one, three. And you're going to start from um, vertex. Here's going to be our V. You were telling me the shortest path spanning tree from V to every other node is going to be ka-chunk, ka-chunk, right? And you're telling me what if I increase each weight by what? Two. Two. This is now going to become five, three, and three. What is the shortest path spanning tree of the graph now after we have done that? Okay, we have a path of length 3 to this node but, and a path of length 5 to that node, and that's the shortest path 3. Does everybody see that the topology changed? Okay, that, that provoked some, some, some reaction, which is good. I like reaction. Any questions or comments about that? Does everybody see what the, what, what's happened? The shortest path spanning tree is describing how do you get shortest path from V to everybody else if you add a node to a, 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 the same edge weight to every, same weight to every edge. Notice that some paths are going to become less desirable. What paths are going to become less desirable? The ones that have a lot of edges in it, right? If you add a, you know, an infinite amount to every edge, suddenly breadth-first search is going to look really good because you're going to want edges that had small amounts of, small numbers of paths with small numbers of edges traversed. Okay? Any questions about that? Now, suppose we did the same thing with minimum spanning tree. Suppose I took a graph and I found the minimum spanning tree, okay, and I increase every one of the uh, edges in the graph by a value of k. Does the minimum spanning tree change? Why, I see people shaking their heads knowledgeably. Why does it not change? Can anyone give me a proof? Why if we add something to the same, uh, uh, you, know, um, you know, again, we're talking about spanning trees. These look like similar problems, spanning trees on weighted graphs. Yeah? If you use Kruskal's algorithm, it will do the exact same thing as before. It will sort the edges from biggest to smallest and go through them. Adding the same amount to the edges doesn't change their relative order. So Kruskal's is not going to be a problem, right? What if you take the edges in a graph 
and multiply all the edges by something. Let's say I take a graph and I multiply the edges by th all edge weights by three. Okay? Does that change the um, minimum spanning tray? Which edges are in the minimum spanning tray? Okay. And I'm seeing a little bit of head shaking. Why is that not going to change it? Same reason as before, okay? If I was bigger than you, when we multiply us by three, I'm still bigger than you. Is that right? And so therefore that doesn't change, that, that won't, minimum spanning tray will do the same thing. What about in a, um, and let's just say for graphs with positive edge weights to make sure there's nothing weird going on. And what about shortest path? If I multiply all the edges by three, does that change the, um, the, the, the uh, order of the shortest path? Does that change the topology of this tree? Okay. I'm going to claim the answer to that is no. And the reason is, if you think about it, is because um, what do you do if you want to convert something from meters to something to feet? What do you do? You multiply each thing in meters by three, don't you? It's about three feet per meter, so three point something, whizzawig. Does that change the order of the, 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 if, you know, do Europeans who use the metric system compared to Americans who use feet, would we have different shortest paths between two places? The answer is no, okay. But again, that would, this needs to be a consequence of the algorithm. I think that's got to be clear that that's, these properties hold. Any questions about that? Okay. Okay, good. Let's see if I can erase this thing and move on. Actually, before I show you how to find shortest paths, I want to show you something else, um, which is that shortest paths, I claim, are in some ways a more useful problem. You know, in my practice, my, my experience, um, minimum spanning trees are good things, important things to know about. Finding shortest paths is an even more important thing to know about. And it's not just because um, transportation problems get modeled as shortest paths. There are a lot of problems that if you look at it the right way, you really have a shortest path problem. And I'd like to give you one example of this just to kind of motivate you which is one of the war stories in the book. But it has to do with um, a, a project we once had to uh, try to reconstruct text typed on a telephone to figure out what you meant. Again, you guys now, uh, you, know, you know, I see you you're actively texting with two thumbs or something like that. In the olden days, we had phones which had nine, you know, you know 10 of 12 keys. Okay, and you know when you look at a, a landline, and presumably also at your cell phone, you know that there typically are three letters on each digit of a telephone. And you could imagine trying to type in a telephone, um, type in text on a telephone by, um, you know, if you want to type in an A, B, or a C, you hit the two key, which has an A, B, and C on it, and maybe you then have to disambiguate which three of them there are, which of the three possibilities it is. Well, we once tried to do this with an information theory thing, where we tried to guess which of the three letters you meant to type at any given point. Okay? Recognize when you press a two, okay, it could be any one of these things. Okay? It could be an A or a B or a C. So what do we assume? We assume that someone is typing in text at one keystroke per letter, and they're using the star key as a space, 
Okay, and we want to try to guess what they typed in. Now, a lot. One thing you might think about is, what if I take a uh, set of words between? I go through the dictionary and try to type in every word in the dictionary on a telephone. If you think about it, these telephone codes act like a hash code. I'm converting a word to a, a, a number, right? By typing in each letter, okay? And two words, you know, the same word is always gonna go to the same code. But the problem is that two words might go, two different words might go to the same code. Boy, box, cow, and any are all typed in the same way on a telephone. Okay, I, I, someone can verify that. I hope I'm right. Get this right. Boy, box, to, uh, uh, any, and cow all use the same set of three, the same sequence of, of phone codes. So how can we figure out which one of those words they meant to type? Well, here we're going to use context. What I said is, we, what we're going to do is to take your stream of things that came in. For every word between the symbols, we're going to come up with a list of words that uh, are consistent with it. Okay, so we've got the things with the first one could be give or hive. The second word could be of or me. The third one was only a. The other one was ring, ping, sing. Okay, how could we figure out which of the word in each column was the word you intended to type? Maybe we could think of it as uh, pick the, how, yeah, any ideas how you would do that? Okay, maybe you, you might guess, well, let's find which is the most common word. Okay, and then um, that would say give of, uh, probably sing. Okay, so that I don't think is the right way to put it together. What was the way that we ended up doing it? Well, we analyzed a lot of text in advance and said how often does give of occur as a substring in a text? Probably not that often. How often does give me occur as a pattern in a text? That sounds like something more frequent, right? How often does hove, uh, hive of occur? How often does hive me? Okay. You could imagine a world where we construct a graph where for every pair of possible adjacent words, we have an edge that's proportional to how likely it is that those two words appear next to each other in, in text. Okay? And if we've got that weight, we would like give me to be a cheap edge, cheaper than the other edges. And if so, what are we going to do? Then I claim we've got a, de a graph that is a, uh, by putting a source and a sink vertex, we've got a directed graph. In fact, it's a DAG because all the edges go from left to right. It's a weighted graph. And my claim is that the most likely interpretation of this is going to be the lowest cost path, the shortest path, which would mean give me a ring. Any questions about that? Do people see how we turn this problem of reconstructing text on a telephone to a problem of finding the shortest path in, an, in a DAG? Any questions about that? Amazingly often you will find your problem turns out to be a problem of finding a shortest path in the right DAG, okay? In fact, we're going to talk about dynamic programming later in the semester. And one way to look at dynamic programming is every problem in the world is that of finding the shortest path in a DAG, okay? But if you come up with the right, the right graph, 
then your problem reduces to something we know how to solve. Any questions about that? Or is this kind of compelling? So always look out for shortest path problems because, you know, if so, you can just pull an algorithm out of a book rather than try to come up with one by yourself. Okay, so what else did we know about shortest paths? As we talked about last class, if you have an unweighted graph, you're better off, you know, you can use breadth-first search. Breadth-first search will find the way, starting from some vertex, you do a search, okay? And you find the nearest neighbor, all the ones that are within one hops, all the ones that are within two hops, dot, dot, dot. Breadth-first search finds the shortest path from V, if that's the root of the breadth-first search, to every other vertex in the graph. Okay, and that tree of discovery, okay, is going to give you the shortest path three that defines for every vertex what is the shortest path from that vertex, you know, let's call it S, to V. Any questions? Okay, so if you've got an, an undirected graph, an unweighted graph, life is good. If you've got negative cost edges, or especially negative cost cycles in a graph, finding that life is not good, okay, as we discussed last time, if you have a negative cost cycle, if it costs one unit to go from S to here, if it costs minus three, uh, let's make it, uh, let, me, sorry, let me try that again. If we went from S, to here, to here, to here, to here, to here, to T. If this was one, one, uh, one, one, minus four, the shortest path from S to T would be what? Going like this. I will pay one plus, um, I will get a minus two. Here my total cost would be minus one, right? And if I go around again, my cost will be minus three, minus five, minus seven. Does everybody see that I will loop infinitely before I decide to keep going? So we're assuming that all edge weights are positive if we want to find shortest paths, because weird things happen when you've got negative weights. Any questions? Okay. Now let's look at how you find a uh, shortest path in, um, in a graph. And the algorithm that's famous for this is something called Dijkstra's algorithm. And the idea here behind Dijkstra's algorithm, the reason why Dijkstra's algorithm correct, is a fairly simple observation. Suppose you tell me that this is the shortest path from S to T, and it happens to go through X. Suppose you're telling me that the shortest path from Stony Brook to Chicago goes through the, uh, you know, the, the, the Triborough Bridge. Well, what do I know? The shortest path from Stony Brook to Chicago, if it passes through the Triborough Bridge, it had better include the shortest possible path between Stony Brook and the Triborough Bridge. Why not? Why? Suppose there was a shorter path from Stony Brook to the Triborough Bridge. Well, then you could find the shorter path from Chicago, from Stony Brook to Chicago, by replacing the path between Stony Brook and the Triborough Bridge with a shorter one. Does everybody kind of see that? If you're claiming to find the short, if the shortest path between S and T goes through X, okay? By definition, 
we know that it's got a, that, that the prefix here has to involve the shortest path from S to X. And that's true for every single vertex in this tour. Okay? The shortest path from S to T is going to always have to use, for every vertex on that path, the shortest path from S to that tour, to, to that vertex. And therefore, that suggests a, the following kind of an idea. We're going to want to start from S, and we're going to want to build up our tree consisting of the shortest vertices to which we know absolutely the shortest path from S to. And we're going to want to start, again, start, if we're standing at S, what is the shortest path to get from S to S in any graph with positive edge weights? Let's remember, say this this way. If I have a graph with positive edge weights, what's the shortest path to get from S to itself? Yeah? Zero. Just do what, stand there, right? Don't do something. Stand there, right? And that's only true, notice, if the graph does not have negative edge weights. If it had a negative cycle, weird things would happen. What we're going to want to do is to start from S, and in each iteration, add one new vertex to the tree, okay, to which we absolutely certain know what the shortest path to that vertex is. And we're going to keep growing this, okay, until we have built this for the, over the entire graph, okay? And so we're going to basically find the shortest path from S to every other vertex in terms of decre increasing distance from S, okay? So it's a little like breadth first search. We're going to start from one, find all the ones that are closest, find the next closest, find the next closest, Okay, that's the idea. Any questions? Actually, let's look at an example here. Maybe before I even show you this thing, let's look at an example. If I start out at vertex 1A here, and I want to know the shortest path to some other vertex, what vertex do I know the shortest path to? Okay. What happens if I look at all the outgoing vertices, uh, edges of A? This was the closest one, the smallest of the outgoing edges from A. Does everybody agree? Is 5 the absolute shortest path? between, let's call this vertex uh, B. Is 5 the shortest path from A to B? Just because it's the, the, the lowest weight edge on A? The answer is yes. Why do I know there can't be a shortcut through that edge to get to B? Yeah? Because this value is greater than 5? And there's no negative cost weight edge, right? Paths are only going to grow longer the way you take it, right? So yes, now I know the shortest way to get to, um, to, to that vertex B. What is the next vertex that is closest to A? Okay. What's the cost of the next vertex that's the closest one, next closest to A? Okay, anyone have a proposal? I guess it'd probably be better if I had names for these things, but certainly with weights. My claim is that there's no cheaper way to get to this vertex from A. Why? Because I can get to this vertex in 7, is there a cheaper way to go through B? Well, if we look at the outgoing edges of B, I can get to the top thing in a cost of less than or equal to 12. 
And through B, I could get to this thing in a cost of less than or equal to 14. 9 plus uh, 5. But 7 is less than this. So I know that's the next cheapest vertex I know how to get to. That's a distance of, this one is 5 from where I started. This one is 7 from where I started. What other vertex is cheapest to get to now? Is there any other vertex that's cheapest to get to? My claim is that if I go through this vertex, I can get to here in a cost of less than 11. Here I can get to in a cost of 7 plus 4 less than or equal to 11. What about this one? I can get to this one in 7 plus 3 or less than or equal to 10. Does everybody agree? So what is my next cheapest thing to grab? That edge. There, I know I can get to there in 10. That's the cheapest of all possibilities. Okay. Now what do I know? I can get to this in a cost of less than or equal to 11, this in a cost less than or equal to 11, this in a cost of less than or equal to 12. Where should I go next? I could take either the top or the bottom, okay? I happen to have chosen this in the example. This thing is cost 11. Okay, there's no new vertex that I discovered a shorter path to. Here, actually, what do I know? I can get to this at a cost of 11. I could also have gotten to it at a cost of 12, but I like 11 better. And now, from either of these, I don't discover a cheaper way to get to the last one. This is my... Um, shortest path three. Does everybody kind of see that? So what is my algorithm for this going to be? This is Dijkstra's algorithm. And what am I going to do? I'm going to start out by saying that I only know the shortest path from S to itself. I'm going to say the distance to every other vertex is going to be infinite at first, because I don't know if it's even, no other vertex maybe is not even part of the same component. Then what am I going to do? I'm going to look at all the edges outside of S, okay, and the distance to that vertex V. Okay, if there's an edge SV, the distance from the best way I know of to get to it is going to be the distance SV. And the last vertex I added was S, what am I going to do? While the last vertex I added is not my destination, if I want to find the shortest path from S to T, I'm going to take, select the next vertex is the one that is not in the tree, okay, that, uh, that is closest to being in the tree, okay? Then once I've added V to my shortest path spanning tree, okay, I am now going to update the consequences of this. The distance to every version, other vertex X, is either the, the, the cost of adding X so far, or I found a cheaper way to get to X by the cost of V Getting to V plus the cost of the edge from V to X. Okay? Any questions about this? This algorithm should sound familiar. Which algorithm does this smell like? What algorithm? Does this look at all like any algorithm that you've seen before? should look awful, awful lot alike. What, alg gee, what algorithms have you seen that grow a tree one vertex at a time 
by picking the next vertex that's best to add. Did we have any algorithm like that? Yeah? Uh, the, robot one. the robot one? No. The robot one, we, we never actually found a winner, winner for. Which algorithm is this? Yeah? Prim's algorithm, ding, ding, ding. Right, remember we had shortest paths a minute ago? We had the minimum spanning trees? How does this algorithm compare to Prim's algorithm? Well, it is a very, very, very minor difference in, in, in coding than Prim's algorithm. What are the changes from Prim's algorithm? First, the name. It used to be Prim's algorithm. Now we're going to call it Dijkstra's algorithm. Okay, so that's one change. What is the other meaningful change in this algorithm? Okay. Remember what Prim's algorithm did. Prim's algorithm always said we're going to start from one vertex, uh, from a vertex, try to find what is the edge that links the uh, a vertex in our tree to something that's not in the tree. We wanted the cheapest such edge, right? What is the difference now? Okay. I am going to claim that the entire difference between Prim's algorithm and Dijkstra's algorithm is here. Okay? What is the idea? When is it desirable, if we are building a shortest path spanning tree from, from V, suppose there's some vertex here, X, What makes it desirable to add x here as the next vertex to be added to a shortest path spanning tree? In Prim's, we wanted to add the edge of lowest weight, right? If we want to find the shortest path from v to x, do we care only about the weight of this edge? Sorry about that. I don't know how to get rid of this thing. Uh-oh, it's getting worse. If we want to add, if we decide that the tree should grow by x, to, to include x, is the cost of adding this edge just the weight of that edge? What is it that makes it desirable to add x now? It's the cost of getting to the parent of x plus the sum of that edge weight. Okay? Let's, you know, let's imagine a world where, um, you know, the, 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 it, it becomes, the, if you're trying to find the shortest path to a node, okay, yes, You'd like the last hop to be short, but the last hop, it isn't the, the, the weight of the last hop that tells you whether it's good. It's the cost of getting, sorry, to y plus the weight of the edge x, y. Okay? And this idea is reflected in this line. Okay? What is the idea? Once we have added a vertex V to our shortest path spanning tree, we want to look at, not V, uh, here I call it V. I guess it's called the original root R or something. But if we add a particular vertex V, what we want to do now is to look at all the outgoing edges from V and to see if this will lead us to a better way of finding a path to some other vertex. Once we have added v to the, to the tree, well, what do we know? If there exists some vertex w, such that the distance to v plus the edge weight from v to w, if that is less than the current best way of getting to, to w, we have found a shorter path to W. 
And the length of the shortest path to V to W is going to be the distance to V plus the weight of that edge, okay? And the parent, the guy that's now the weight, last hop to get the W is going to be V, okay? Any questions about that? Does anyone remember what this was on Prim's algorithm? If we want to change this back to Prim's algorithm, what do we got to do? What is the update criteria to add an edge here? Okay. Let's think about it. No one? Let's take a look at the global structure of, al uh, of, of Dijkstra's algorithm. Because again, it's the exact same thing as Prim's, and it's kind of a way to introduce us. What is Dijkstra's going to do? We're going to keep track of, for every vertex, oops, is it in a tree or not? What is the best, the cheapest cost way for every vertex to get it into the tree? That's what the distance vector was saying, okay? And we have some variables here. What's the situation at the beginning? Nobody is in the tree. The weight to, distance to every vertex is going to, from, from our start vertex, is going to be infinite. And the parent of every vertex is unknown at this point. In general, once we have the start vertex, the distance to the start is zero. And now, V is the last vertex on the path. Start is the last vertex of the path. While the last vertex on the path is not in the tree yet, what are we going to do? Let's add it to the tree. Now V is in the tree. If the vertex is not equal to start, okay, well, we want to print out the parent, okay? The start, remember, didn't have a parent, okay? Because it was, it was given to us. It wasn't something we discovered. What are we going to do? Okay, if V is not going to be the, the start, um, then uh, the weight of uh, uh, the total weight in the tree, actually, I guess this, isn't, this, is, this was needed for f keeping the total weight of the edges which was interesting in minimum spanning tray. It's less interesting in shortest path, so we don't really need that. But what's the interesting thing? Well, once we go through every, once we've added vertex V to the tree, okay, we're gonna look at all the outgoing edges, okay? While there is an outgoing edge from V, let's call the other edge W. If the distance, the shortest distance we have up to W now is greater than the distance to V from the start plus the weight of that edge, the edge to W, then the new way of getting to W is going to go through V, and we're going to note that by making the parent. Once we do this, we now need to go through and find what is the next vertex to add to our tree? Well, we want to find for all vertices that are not in the tree, which is the one that is the shortest distance from the start. And we'll keep track, and we're going to have V is going to be that vertex, and the distance of it is the distance of V. Okay? Any questions about that? Do people see how Dijkstra's algorithm works? Any questions? What is the running time of Dijkstra's algorithm? Let's take a look at this and figure that out. What is the running time of Dijkstra's algorithm? Well, what are we going to do? This is going to be order what? For each vertex, set some flags. What's that going to be? O of n. 
What is this? While V is, sorry about that, let's blow this away. While V is not in the entry. What is that going to go around? How many times is that while loop going to go around? Oh, well then, we're going to gradually add every vertex to the shortest path spanning tree, right? And how long is this going to go around? Well, generally we've got a loop here, which is going to go around how many times? What's this going to go around? The degree of V. Now we've got one other loop here. Let me get rid of this. And how much is this going to go around? This is going to check every vertex to see if it's in the tree yet, and if not, is it cheaper to get into the tree than any of the others? How much is that going to cost? N, N times N, this is an order N squared algorithm. Okay, any questions? So Dijkstra's algorithm finds the shortest path from V to every other vertex in order N squared time. Any questions about that? Again, if I just go through the punchline, that's basically exactly what the punchline is. Okay, any questions? Yes? Okay, so the answer is I am finding the shortest path from S to every vertex in the graph. You're saying, hey, I only care about the shortest path from, you know, S to, to my particular target T. Okay? Let's say you want to find the cheapest way to find uh, the, uh, what you call it, the path from here to... Um, Smith Haven Mall, I would start by finding the shortest path from here to every place in the United States. And you may say that sounds wasteful, okay? And it does seem wasteful if there's a short path. How would you fix Dijkstra's algorithm? Here's my Dijkstra's algorithm here. What would you do Okay, if you knew that you wanted to stop at some vertex t and you wanted to find the shortest path to it, what would you, what, how would you change the algorithm? So if you only really cared about the distance between s and some other, one other vertex, how would you change that? Yes? So like, maybe just stop it when you hit that vertex? Why don't we instead change this wall not, V is not in tree, or um, V equals the target. Then bomb out of this thing, and I've got enough of a tree to get me from my source to my target, right? Now, that would be good for finding the, the pair between two nodes, but notice that in the worst case, you might have to go through every node in the graph to pr find the shortest path from S to it. Okay? Notice that in each round of these things, it is finding the shortest path between S and another node. Okay? But if it's not a node you don't care about it, you don't want to spend the time. But if the target happens to be the last vertex we pulled it in, okay? then that was necessary. So your idea is a good idea in practice, and hopefully will cause it to stop quickly if you only had one. But if you got unlucky, okay, in the worst case, it will still require n squared time. Because the vertex you want might not be, might be the last, the target might be the last one we add to the tree. Any questions about that? Okay, any other questions about finding shortest paths? 
Okay? Do people now see how Kruskal's algorithm is a lot like Prim's algorithm? That should now be believable. What do we need to do to turn Kruskal's back into Prim's algorithm? Okay, if we wanted to unchange this. This is the critical sign that you understand the difference between why Prim's is good for minimum spanning tree and Dijkstra's is good for finding shortest paths. Okay, what do we have to do to turn this back into Prim's algorithm? Anyone? Is he twitching? Yes? What if I did, you want to say get rid of this? Is that what you're saying? If I got rid of this and this, that would do it get us back to Prim's algorithm. Why? What is the criteria that we found the better way in a minimum spanning tree to add W to it? If we're building a minimum spanning tree, and here we've got an edge, that weighs, let me, okay, let's say, here we've got an edge of weight 7, and here we got an edge of weight, this was where we started, and this was the weight, edge of weight 7. Are either of these more, more desirable than the other? On the other hand, which one of these leads to a shorter path for some vertex? It should be clear that this is the shortest path, and that's a cheap shortest path. This is going to be a long shortest path. In adding the edge to the minimum spanning tree, we don't care how we got there. So for minimum spanning tree, we just want that as our criteria for whether a, we found a cheaper way to get to W, to include W in our tree. But when we're talking about shortest paths, if we want to know what's the cheapest way to get to W, it's not just the edge cost of the edge from V to W, but it's the cost of getting there as well. And that's captured by the distance of V. Any questions? Yes, I am hoping there is some light. I'm not sure I'm seeing light in people's eyes. I'm seeing dullness in people's eyes, weariness in people's eyes. Any questions about this? Okay. I encourage you to figure out, make sure you know how Prim's algorithm works, and when you do, see why this change is all that it takes to find shortest paths. The truth is, Dijkstra figured out both the first, a, a minimum spanning free algorithm and uh, what you call it, and the shortest path algorithm at the same time. But he didn't know about Prim. Prim was a few up years before him. So that's why it's called Prim's algorithm and not both of them named after Dijkstra. Okay? Any questions about that? About why minimum span? Prim's algorithm looks good for both of them. Okay? Any questions? Okay. There are faster ways that you could implement Dijkstra's algorithm. And let's say the first one is one that maybe you can understand. We could make Dijkstra's algorithm run in m times log n time. Why would m log n be better than n squared? Prim's algorithm, as we ran it before, ran in n squared time. I mean, Dijkstra's algorithm ran in n squared time. If I could implement it in m log m n time, is that always better? No. Is it sometimes better? Yes. For what kind of graphs is it better? Sparse graphs with relatively small edges numbers of edges. 
What could I do? Well, if you think about what Prim's al Dijkstra's algorithm is doing, okay, it is doing what? It has kind of two phases in it. One phase is about finding, okay, one phase here, let's just look at these two phases. Kabunk. One phase is about finding which vertex is closest to the root. Okay, the one that minimizes all the values in that distance array. If we wanted to quickly find what was the smallest value in an array, what would be a good data structure to do that? A heap, right? Remember we had heaps? Heaps were good at finding the smallest value. What if I turned distance into a heap? Now, okay, I would have the problem that how much time should it take to find if I have in my heap only the ones that are in the tree, that are not in the tree, if I have a heap of, all, of the distances of all vertices not in a tree, how much time will it take to find the smallest one? Okay, yeah? O of one. Once I then remove it from the, the, if I now put that vertex into the tree, I've now got to delete that value from my heap, right? How much time does it take to readjust the heap after I delete the root? Log n. So it should be clear that this can kind of be done in log n time. And what is this thing doing? This thing is going to go through all the outgoing edges, okay? And for each one that we decide to do this with, okay? It's going to, um, what you call it? We, we may have to update the value in that heap, okay? If you have a d data structure that gets me a pointer to the item in the heap, okay? Uh, I, can, I, ca I can then go and update it. Each, it could be for every edge in the tree, okay? I might have to update this thing. There's at most m edges in the graph. If each one of them is going to cause a logarithmic time operation, then we get something that is m log n. Okay? Any questions about that? The details there are a little harder, you, but actually if you're on the ball, you could figure it out from what I said there. Any question? And this is an even more macho data structure that we're not going to talk about that lets you do it even faster. Okay, any questions? Any questions on how we find shortest paths in graphs? Okay, any questions? Um, okay, any questions about the homework? I'm gonna talk about another shortest path algorithm, which is very interesting. But I'm willing to let you lure me as away by talking about any of the homework or any problem or any topic before I get around to that. Does anybody have any questions that they want answered? Or do people instead want to see a, an interesting, slick, shortest path algorithm? The lack of interesting questions will mean you want to learn about an interesting, slick, shortest path algorithm. Any questions? Okay, it's clear the class uniformly, universally wants to learn about a slick shortest path algorithm. Okay, let me talk about it a, a different, Dijkstra's algorithm is the right algorithm for finding the shortest path from S to every other vertex in the graph. Okay, now, um, sometimes you want to know the shortest path not between V and everybody else,
but the shortest path from every vertex to every other vertex in the graph. Okay? You could imagine wanting to take an, an n vertex graph and create an n by n matrix where element ij is the length of the shortest path from i to j. Sorry, God knows how to get this thing up. Go away. Such that m sub ij, we want to be the length of the shortest path the shortest path from I to J, okay? If we wanted to know for a particular vertex V, what was the length of the shortest path to every other vertex in the graph, we would simply run Dijkstra's algorithm, right? And Dijkstra's algorithm will tell us the length from V to every other vertex in the graph. If we want to know from any vertex to any other vertex how long it takes, so that you could look up the length of the shortest path in constant time, we could run Dijkstra's algorithm n times, one with each different starting point, and fill in one row of that matrix. Okay? Does everybody kind of agree with that? Any questions? So I could fill in this matrix if in, by running Dijkstra's n times, each time I run Dijkstra's from one vertex, it took n squared, that would tell me that that would give me an n cubed algorithm to solve the so-called all pair shortest path, to find the distance from one vertex to every other vertex, okay? Why might we want to know the distance from every one vertex to every other vertex? Well, maybe if you're trying to build a, uh, find what is the best place to put a, you know, some kind of facility on a network, you would like this node to be the one that has, is, is most closely located to all the other vertices in the graph, right? If we can imagine some kind of an island, and you're trying to put one university down on the island. Where should you put it? Ideally, you will put it in the center so everybody can commute and nobody has too horrible a commute. That's what the center means. If you want to find out which vertex in the, in the graph is the center, you want the one that will maybe minimize the maximum edge, maximum the, which vertex is furthest away. To do that, if you have the all pair shortest path, you can ans answer that problem easily. Any questions? Okay, so I want to solve the all pair shortest path problem. Any questions about that? It should be clear if you understand what I'm doing, you can do this with, um, what you call it, with uh, using, using Dijkstra's n times. Okay, but I want to show you a really simple, uh, slick way of doing this. Okay, that's going to actually be an introduction to some of the ideas we're going to use later in this class on something called dynamic programming. Okay, um, and dynamic programming is going to be a way of solving algorithm problems by coming up with a recursive algorithm for it, evaluating the recurrence in a bottom-up fashion, as we'll say, and then um, reading the answer off uh, what, from the recurrence that you evaluated. This is still a mystery, so I don't want you to understand that yet, but understand you're going to understand it soon. Let me give you an example of how you can use the ideas of a recursive algorithm, a recurrence relation, a recursive formula, to find shortest paths. First, what is the, let us consider, what is the, if we wanted to build a matrix where we have vertex ij is the length of the shortest path from i to j going through no intermediate vertices. 
what is the shortest path from I to J going through no intermediate vertices? Okay, if I give you a weighted graph, what would that be? This is not hard. What is it? The edge. Okay. If I'm not allowed to take a detour, what's the shortest way from me to you? Well, it's got to be a direct thing. If there is an edge from I to J, then the shortest path from I to J using no intermediates is the weight of it. If I is equal to, if I is equal to J, what's the shortest path from I to I? If I'm not allowed to go through any intermediates, just stay where I am. It's still zero, right? And if I and J are not connected by an edge, then what's the shortest path from me to you that goes through nobody else? It's infinite, right? There's no way of getting to it. Does everybody agree that this defines the cost matrix of the shortest path between any pair of vertices going through no intermediate nodes. Okay? Any questions about that? Now, let's look at a magic recurrence. Okay? What if I'm now going to allow you to go through vertex 1? as an intermediate. Okay? What is the shortest path to get from I to J if I'm allowed to use vertex 1 as an intermediate? I claim that there are only two possibilities. One is you go to I through J without using vertex 1. What's the shortest path to get between Stony Brook and Smith Haven Mall, which doesn't pass through Chicago? Well, it's basically, uh, I mean, where you're allowed to pass through Chicago. If I'm allowing you to drive through Chicago, does that give you a, a, an easier way to get the Smith Haven Mall from here? No, right? So allowing you to go through a vertex does not mean it's going to lead to a shorter path, right? So it might be that the shortest path going from I to J, where you're allowed to go through Chicago, is the same as it was if you were not allowed to go through Chicago, right? But what's the shortest path from I to J if you are allowed to go to sh through Chicago? I claim it's the shortest path from I to Chicago plus the shortest path from Chicago to J. Does this kind of make sense? If you want to, if, if I'm telling you that you've got to drive to the Smith Haven Mall through Chicago, how should you do it? You drive from here to Chicago, use the absolute shortest possible way of getting there, and then drive from Chicago to Smith Haven Mall using the absolute shortest way. Does everybody see that if, and this is the key idea here, so I want everybody to look at this one, if we are allowed to use, let's say that d sub ij k minus 1 is the cheapest path to, way to get from i to j using vertices 1 to k minus 1. And d i j uh, uh, sub, k, sub k, superscript k, is the shortest path from i to j using any vertices from 1 to k. We'll assume every vertex has a number. That's what it does on an adjacency matrix, right? Every ver number, vertex has, you know, is a number from 1 to n. What is the idea here? 
If D sub i j is the cheapest way to get from i to j using vertices 1 through k as possible intermediaries, my claim is that it is the cheaper of two possibilities. One is we didn't bother to go through vertex k, in which case it's the cheapest way to go through vertices i to, from i to j using vertices 1 to k minus 1 as an intermediary. k is, it, is no good. Otherwise, if it did do us good, we want to get from i to k using vertices 1 through k minus 1 as intermediaries, plus the distance of getting from k to j using, again, the same set of possible intermediaries. Okay? How many people see where this equation comes from? Or does this make any sense? Who here does it make sense to? Raise your hand proudly. There's a small number of you. Okay? I see some of you are so proud you're twitching fingers but not raising arms. Any questions about this? Okay? This is a recursive thing. Why is it a recursive thing? Remember what recursion was? It was when you called something by, you solved something by breaking it to a smaller case, right? You want to figure out what is D of I, J, K. Notice it's going to depend upon values where the third value is K minus 1. Okay? You can kind of think of this, and maybe write this as, if you don't like it like uh, with a superscript, write it as a three-parameter recurrence. Min of D, I, J, K minus 1 plus this other thing, comma, the other one. Right? Does everybody see that I'm kind of determining this value in terms of values with smaller indices? That is kind of what you did when you were doing recursion. Right? In recursion, you're breaking it down, your big problem, into a smaller problem. And you needed to end on a base case where you knew what the right answer was. What was the base case that you knew the right answer was? What if k is equal to zero? Okay, actually, sorry, let me go back here again. This is the case where you were not allowed anybody being used as an intermediary. You knew how to do that when you were doing, had nobody as an intermediary. Does everybody agree? Now, what if I am, I want to compute it for I allow one to be an intermediary. This is nobody, nobody, one. Does everybody agree that if I knew, these are based on values that are, um, what you call it, have no vertices as intermediaries, right? Do you see that? I could build this up now where I'm allowing vertex 1 as an intermediary. And once I know that, now let's set this to be, let's say I want to know when I'm allowing 1 and 2 as possible intermediaries. If I now know the matrix where I'm allowed to use 1 as an intermediary, I can now compute it where I'm allowed to use 1 and 2 as possible intermediaries. Then based on that, I'm going to be able to compute it using 1 and 3, 1, 2 and 3, 1, 2 and 4, 1, 2 and 5, dot, dot, dot. Do you see that starting from the basis case, of k equals 0. I can solve it, use this formula to update it for 1, 
two, three, dot, dot, dot. Okay? Any questions about that? What does that mean? That means that this is Floyd's algorithm for all pair shortest path. It only has four loops. Remember when that back in those days when you liked four loops because they were easy to analyze? They only went around n times, right? What are we going to do? K is the set of intermediaries. We can use one, or then one and two, then one, two, and three, then one, two, three, and four, dot, dot, dot. We start with the cost matrix where um, basically the weight was, the, the intermediaries were zero. Then for every i and j, we are going to update it now for a new intermediary by using the results we had in our old intermediaries. So everybody see this is the formula we had? This is three for loops and it does what we want. What is the running time of this algorithm? Here's one you should be able to analyze. What is the running time of this algorithm, Floyd's algorithm? Does anybody have an idea? What? N cubed. Why is it N cubed? N times N times N times what? This is look a number up in a table. This is look a number up in a table. Look a number up in a table. Add them up to each other. Take the smaller of these two numbers and copy it into that array. How much time does this one step row take? How much? What? Constant time if you've got these guys sitting in a table waiting for you to look it up, right? So if you store all these guys, you can look them up. This is going to take n cubed time. Now it turns out that's not better than Dijkstra's algorithm. And Dijkstra's algorithm, we said, was n cubed, right? But it is pretty unbelievable that you can do it with this kind of short, you know, amazingly elegant algorithm. Boom, there's Floyd's algorithm. This is Floyd's algorithm. Okay, in C. Okay, and that's the entire thing. Okay, any questions? I encourage you to think about it, try to understand Floyd's algorithm, because if you do, you will find your life when we get to dynamic programming, which is looming over the horizon, is going to be much, much easier. This is kind of a poster child for dynamic programming. Okay? Any questions about that? Any questions about finding shortest paths? Okay, so in the meantime, do the shortest path you can to finish homework three, and I will see you guys on Thursday. Any questions? Okay, thank you.